Good morning, everybody. I'm David Pollack, Chair of the Community Security Initiative. I'm glad to welcome you to this episode of Consultants Corner. Today, we're, well, before I get to today, I just want to remind everyone that the Nonprofit Security Grant Program will come soon. When it comes, it might have a very, very narrow window. So I advise everyone to get started now. If you have had grants in the past, you've already done your pre-qualified, except that your pre-qualification could lapse because you haven't resubmitted some documents that have to be renewed annually. So check out your grants gateway, document fault, and just make sure that you're totally up to date. You can do that now and not under pressure. I sent out an email last week. The IJ is going to change. They say it's going to simplify. We don't know what the simplifications will be. So take the safe road and try to figure out what the answers will be to the various questions. There will be fewer questions this year, but uh, it's better to be safe than sorry. You might just have a week to submit everything. So I would hope that you have everything ready. Today, we're going to continue our door frame and hardware assessment episode, and we have two very, very special guests, Carol Racine and Sarah Bennett from uh, CBR Architectural Hardware. Carol and Sarah are CSI's go-to experts in this. Carol is a refugee from the New York area, left us for North Carolina, and she claims to be very happy down there, although I can't understand it being an inveterate New Yorker. Carol started CBR, and she is what is called a certified architectural hardware consultant. That's a two-day, eight-hour-per-day test. She had to work for her expertise. She took Sarah in as an apprentice, and one has to apprentice for five years before you can sit for the test. They are really are incredible experts. Let me just tell you that when the FBI is building their headquarters or the State Department is looking for an embassy overseas and they want something secure, Carol and Sarah are the go-to people. They've done lots of jobs here in, New, in the New York area. And what they do is very focused. And I'm going to turn over the microphone to them. And they'll explain what they do and what you should be doing with your doors, your door frames, and your hardware. Carol and Sarah, take it away. Hi, good morning. I'm Carol Racina, and I have been in business for 47 years as an architectural hardware consultant. And I absolutely love what I do. I joke about it, but hardware is my other life. And um, Sarah came to join me six years ago, and she is now getting ready to take her due two-day registry exam and then she will be kicking me to the curb eventually because I'm going to be 72 in September and she thinks it's time for me to retire and go have fun but I'm still going to work for her anyway <laughs> so uh, we write specifications only back in the day I actually was a distributor of both doors frames and hardware it was risky business because people didn't pay their bills and God was very good when I got a job that was a half a million dollars and I actually used my home as equity so that I could pay my bills to the manufacturers. As I said, thanks to God, I was able to get that money because it was a bonded job. Uh, Verizon Wireless at the time thought that they should put them on as friends and family because I called the dormitory authority in New York State like every day to find out if my contractor had gotten paid. So while we can't tell you where to go to get stuff, where to get an installer or things like that. You know, we can help point you to the products from the various manufacturers that would work best for your facilities. We're not involved with cameras or card readers or anything like that. We will tell you about the electrified hardware that you might need and so forth. Basically, we've prepared a booklet that David has that gives you guidelines on things that you can do to help your facility. Yeah, so this is our first week participating in the Consultants Corner, and we apologize if any of the information is repeat from the previous weeks, but hopefully you'll still learn something new and take away something from this presentation. Carol said that we did partner with CSI a couple years ago to help prepare a 
building hardening guideline packet. And this is a little outside our typical everyday work because usually we just write the specification section 087100 door hardware and review the corresponding submittals to that. So this was a little new, but we learned something while we were doing it too. So this was, we will share that with you today. Yeah, one of the things that is really special to us is the restoration part that you're trying to save some of these beautiful historical facilities and you know keep their integrity but making it safe for everybody and that's something that we are very passionate about also. So the goal of building protection is to reduce any vulnerabilities to your threats. Some of the aspects that we're going to talk about today are the perimeter of the building which is your first line of defense and it's important to ensure that your doors and frames are in good quality and in good condition. Your doors and frames are basically worthless if you don't have the appropriate security hardware installed on them. A door with a passage set is not going to do any good. And then many people overlook the window glazing surrounding the doors and frames, even though that's sometimes the easiest and most accessible route. And then we also wanted to discuss about enhancing your physical and operational security, which is just as important. This can include sensors and a mechanical response system. So some of the common door and frame vulnerabilities that we see, many have to do with your exterior door types that are selected. And some of them that we see are flush glass doors that have no, no frame around them. It's all glass. We also see a narrow style storefront door that has a very minimal style around the door. We see sliding doors. And we see wood doors. One thing when we're talking about door and frame threats is that we would prefer not to see any of these types of doors, if at all possible. None of these really provide the adequate security and they can be easily defeated. They are also, the narrow style is also prone to warpage because there's just not enough meat on the door. Sliding doors are easily defeated as well and, you know, wood doors, they're not the worst option, but it's not the most ideal if you have a choice. One thing that we do recommend that is if you are going to go with a, a wood door or something, try and keep your door height as low as possible or a framed glass door. Try and keep it under eight feet. Taller doors are prone to more problems with closing and latching due to air pressure and wind gusts. And we deal with that all the time, especially in New York. <laughs> we hear a lot of a lot of problems with the wind pulling the doors open. Taller doors are also more prone to be bowed and warped. So that's the door and frame. And so we can talk about hardware vulnerabilities that we see. Often some of the common hardware that we see are magnetic lock, which fail safe during a power failure and have to fail safe to be provide immediate means of egress. And if you're not sure what fail safe means, that means that it unlocks, the power drops from it, it unlocks and your doors are just push and pull. We also see electric strikes. And a lot of times we see cylindrical locks. And the way you can tell the difference between a cylindrical lock and a mortise lock is in the lever handle. If you see the push button or if your key cylinder is in the lever handle, that's a cylindrical lock. If your key cylinder is above in a separate piece, that's what a mortise lock looks like. And the other thing, as you can see projecting from the cylindrical lock there is the latch bolt. And the average latch bolt that you get is only a half an inch projection into your frame. And depending on how your door is sitting in your frame, you could have just the tip of that latch bolt in your strike and easily it can be popped open and defeated. So with a mortise lock, you get a three quarter inch row of that latch bolt, which gives you that additional protection. And there's normally a little piece of, it looks like a little round cylinder that you, when you put it into, when it goes into the strike, that pushes back and dead latches that latch bolt so that you can't defeat it. If you want to come to my house, you could be in in two seconds if I don't have the deadbolt on because it's got a half inch throw that the builder put in without that deadlocking latch feature. Now you know I'm vulnerable, just like <laughs> some of your facilities are. So you probably guessed that these are not the best, not ideal. What we would recommend is for your exterior doors or for any interior doors that you're trying to keep secure, we would recommend having an electrified lock set or an electrified panic device, depending on what's required for that opening. We would recommend using a commercial grade one mortise lock. And then 
not all locks are created equally. A lot of businesses go for the cheaper option, which is a residential type of hardware. And a lot of those residential products have plastic parts in them. So as you can imagine, they, they tend to break down much easier. But if you do have these kinds of things, there's still ways to harden some of it. And Sarah will be showing that as we go through the slides. So existing openings that are not being replaced can have modifications that will harden the existing hardware. Some of these are ways that can protect your lock from being bypassed, such as uh, lash guards. This is where the gap between the frame and the door, which is one of the weakest points of the door, is too wide and a crowbar can fit inside. The latch guard prevents that crowbar from being able to go in, and it's made of a heavy gauge steel that can't be bent. And then it's also bolted, specifically through bolted, the, through the door, so that even that is extremely difficult to get it out of the way so that then they could first get to your latch bolt. Port collars are a piece of hardware that you can install that prevents anybody from being able to grab your cylinder with channel iron locks or pliers and twisting it. It spins freely, so if someone was to grab hold of the cylinder, it would just continue to spin. It would not break the cylinder off. And that would be on a mortise lock. And then having pick-resistant high security locks, something that's more than just four pins. A lot of locks, you can just replace the cylinder with a new key instead of replacing your entire lock, a lot of times you can just replace the cylinder with one that's more high security. So as you can see from the pictures there, the first one is the latch guard and where it shows the little things around it, that is a pin that you would drill a hole into the face of your door. So when your door is closed, this gives additional security because they can't maneuver it as easily. And then the next one is the cylinder guard which around the cylinder, you know, they go to twist it. If you twist the cylinder, you can actually then open a door. And you know, if you get the cylinder out of the way, you can maneuver it. And so that prevents that. And then the next one, as you can see, not only does it have your cuts on the cylinder above, but then they also those special little ridges that you see along it, that is an additional layer of keying protection that prevents it. And keys can be stamped, do not duplicate, so if somebody was to get your key, they can't go to a local Ace Hardware or whatever and get the key copied because it specifically says that it can't be copied. It can be copied, but that would only be by an unscrupulous person. So there are a couple additional ways that you can reinforce your door hardware. You can use something that's security hinge pin. This is an inexpensive way. You can remove a screw from every hinge and install in a security pin in its place. That means that when the door is closed, the pin goes into the hole that's left behind, and there is an image. So even when the hinges are cut off, it still keeps the door and the frame together as one. There are these additional reinforced strike plates, or you could even wrap your door. That would be for a cylindrical lock prep and a deadbolt prep above. And these are all easy things that you can get. I mean, you can find them even on Amazon. It, it helps uh, the budget is inexpensive, but gives you a little more protection. And it doesn't mean that all of these should be installed on every door. It really depends on the situation. It depends on your opening. It depends on how, you know, which way it swings. It, there's a lot that depends on, you know, which, which of these may work for your opening. I'm sure in some previous consultant corners, you've talked a lot about the glazing and we see glazing in most all buildings now. The, the glazing should be avoided in locations where you have high delay goals because it is really easy to get through. If someone wants to attack, then they typically go for places that are obvious ways to get through and a window just screams, I can get, I can go through. When window glazing is avoidable, then they need to be designed to resist the intrusion. They also could be applied with some anti-shatter film or you could upgrade your type of glass. So we had an example here. You may recognize this door, many of you. So we have some good aspects. When we first look at this door, we see some, some things are, are really good. We have a hollow metal frame. We have some sort of electrified hardware and it's self-closing. We see a closer on there. But we also notice some things 
that aren't so good, like the wood door. We have a huge vision panel. And that's located right next to the lock set. So once they punch that glass out, they just reach in and depress that lever and they're in the room. This is a cylindrical lock and then it's an in-swinging door. So we were suggesting that you replace this door, or if this was a door for a location that you do want to be a little more secure, we would recommend going with a door type more similar to this. The vision panel, it still has a vision panel so that you're not going to hit someone with the door when you leave, but it's located far enough away from the lever and it's small enough that even if someone did break through, it would be really difficult for them to reach and turn the inside lever. It is an outswinging door. It still has a hollow metal frame. It's still a wood door, which is fine. And we have upgraded to a, a mortise. Well, this might be an exit device. This is probably, probably an exit device. device. Yeah. So upgrading your doors and frames is good, but it also is important to update your operating practice. Some things that you may want to look at is you want to look like and be a hard target because someone who is well-trained and determined can defeat even the forced entry systems in a matter of seconds. I mean, Carol, you found a video of someone New York getting City, in. New York City Fire Department getting into a door that they shouldn't have within seconds with their tool. I mean, it was just amazing, you know, to see it done. You think, oh, wow, I'm safe. Everything is good. And then if somebody, bad person, had that device, it could be in in seconds. So the use of, like, early detection systems, cameras, alarms, alerts to staff, this door was opened, you need to check it out, or this door is attempting to be opened. An appropriate response plan, if something happens, you can have remote lockdown of certain doors. You have a safe space for people to go where they would be protected by doors and the surrounding walls. And hiring a security officer is an option that we thought would be good for some people because that person can control the lockdown system. Especially for some of your synagogues that you're practicing on Shabbat where your doors are not locked. You're, you're totally vulnerable because you're not using the electrified hardware that you could to provide security. So in that case, you need to have a second means of locking your building down. And so hiring somebody, a security person, who could do that for you, who would see the threat coming on the cameras, uh, who could lock it down and then you, and sound an alarm so your people could get to safety. That's a critical thing. We can protect you with a lot of our hardware, but if it's not locked, there's no way that it helps to have it available. Only it would for an empty building. Another thing that we think a lot of people overlook are code compliance. Or code issues. You can't just go into a building and replace the doors without knowing, is your door fire rated? There are only certain field modifications that you can make on fire rated openings. And if you have a condition where you're not sure if you are allowed to make changes to that door, you need to contact someone that can let you know yes or no. A lot of, one of the most common things we see is people drilling a raceway through a door if it doesn't have electrified hardware and they are trying to add electrified hardware to it, they would just field drill a raceway through it. But that's only allowed to be performed if you have written approval from the manufacturer. And then if you have a certified installer that is actually doing it, because then you also have to have your doors relabeled and relisted by the certified installers. Because one of the things with that is if, if you look at the hinge side of your door and frame when your door is open and you see a label that says any kind of, whether it's a 20-minute smoke door, a 45-minute fire-rated door, a 90-minute fire-rated door, that is immediate to say to you, don't even consider making the modifications until you have that certified installer come in and check it out for you. Because otherwise, your insurance is going to be canceled if you have a fire and something happens then your insurance will not pay off on the claim, just so that you know. It was one of the big things with the World Trade Centers when they went down because some of the clients added magnetic locks to stair doors that were re-entry doors because they didn't want anybody getting into their space. And so people in those staircases trying to get across to go to the other staircase 
couldn't get onto the floors. The fire department couldn't get onto the floors. It was insane. They couldn't stand the fire alarm screaming after the planes hit. And so they silenced the fire alarms, which relocked those magnetic locks. So that these are some of the things, not to frighten you, but to keep in mind, you know, you, you can't just make simple changes and say, okay, good, we're done. So that is the presentation that we have. And I'm sure there are going to be lots questions. of questions. <laughs> we're very, very grateful that you, Sarah, and, uh, and Carol have joined us. The community is dealing with all sorts of projects. We really appreciate such well thought out presentation to everyone. This will be recorded, as everyone re should remember. I will remind anyway that these uh, are recorded for everyone's benefit. So you can go back to these and review this information so that you know, if any further questions on your projects arise, there is a little bit of a reminder. Now, why don't we jump into the questions? Why don't I start with something very, very basic? Because for the community, it's very important to know the, the limitations of your service. So you mentioned that you're spec writers. There's, there's a lot that goes behind it, of course, because in order to prepare a specification, right? You have volumes and volumes of product literature to review and understanding and working with manufacturers and understanding field conditions and so on and so on and so forth, working with different trades and architects and so on. So can you just tell us a little bit more about the scope of your services, considering the types of facilities that the community uh, is supporting? So basically how we function is we work a lot with architects mainly. When the architect has created their design development package, which is a list of plans and they have an idea of what kind of hardware they're interested in using, they send it to us and we go through each of the openings in the plan and we'll assign it a hardware set. And that hardware set we detail with more specifics on what each opening needs based on its door type or its size, its height, its thickness, its fire oh, rating, yeah, uh, security requirements, acoustical, right. Acoustical rating. Whether it's blast bullet resistant and so forth. Every piece of hardware is certified by the manufacturers to meet certain criteria. So our job is to pick the products that are going to work with that particular door. And Honestly, it's a nerve wracking thing because if we don't get the preliminary proper information from the architect's drawings and stuff like that, we could be sued if the wrong hardware is on that door and something happens. And I got to tell you, I keep a portable defibrillator under my desk. And when we get an RFI from a contractor, the first thing I do is hook up those electrodes and put my big toe on the switch, ready to take care of myself. And, and then as soon as we open everything, I'm sweating in, I, I got chills. Every time we open all of our documents and we find out that, oh, yes, we're okay. You know, I, I had it sa Sunday morning. I've got one foot out the door when I get a panic call from the construction supervisor at Newark Airport at 8.30 in the morning. He can't reach anybody else, and he has my phone number, even though I've threatened him with death if he bothers me. And he said, Carol, I'm so sorry, but he says, we have a fire alarm inspection tomorrow. We have magnetic hold opens that we have to put at 13 locations so that when the fire alarm goes off, these doors release and automatically close. And the electrical contractor says it's wrong. So, you know, of course now... I run back in, my home office is here, I run back into my office and I pull up everything and I quick send him an email and I say, look, according to everything, you have the right devices. And I said, bye, I'm on my way to church, I'll pray for you, and I left. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and yesterday, yesterday afternoon, he sent back pictures that showed that they in fact did have the right products that we specified. I'm waiting for him to get back to us today and let us know if he got them installed. Can I clarify? So if an architect hires you, that's kind of one way to do business. And it seems like you guys primarily work through architectural firms. So what happens if a facility like a synagogue or a Jewish community center reaches out to you directly? What kind of services would you would you be able to offer? Well, the only thing that we could offer, we do new facilities mostly. You know, of course, if a building has some existing spaces, you know, we'll go through that and work, okay, no, you're going to need to get a new door and frame, as well as new hardware, stuff like that. But pretty much, you know, the, the book that Sarah put together of ideas, you know, that would help to harden, that's the first guidelines. But finding good manufacturing slash 
installation people for your doors and frames. That's that's a critical part that you guys will have to do that, you know, in New York or around the world to get qualified people because they're the ones that are going to say to you when they come into a survey like you've done before, you know, no, this this door and frame isn't suitable. And then the hard part is for you guys to find that. As far as hardware manufacturers go, that's that's pretty easy. That's something we could say to you, hey, give a give a call to a legion and see, you know, what they have to offer as far as mortise locks, cylindrical locks, whatever, like that, you know. So And we would recommend if you if an owner is interested in replacing doors and frames or looking at building a new partition. But I, we think it's crucial that you do maybe get an architect or someone who, you know, is more experienced in that to help you make sure that everything is up to code before you put it in. It shifts a little bit more of the reliability off of the owner and onto the person that's coordinating it. Yeah, one thing that we didn't talk about, and a lot of you have, you know, historical facilities that they're telling you, no, no, you can't touch your exterior doors. And the other thing is, is that if your exterior doors are open, a couple of times we've told you, you know, try and see if you can compartmentalize where you can build an interior vestibule that's secure, you know, that you can, that would be a door that your group could lock down immediately, even if they penetrated the exterior of your building. And now you've got them in that area. So you can get help. That was a cue for our next question. Carol, you mentioned that a lot of facilities will have existing doors, and there are ways to make some modifications to them to harden them. You showed some features for the doors, like latch guards, a few others. To what extent is it possible to actually modify doors to be forced entry resistant? That's really difficult. I mean, you know, for example, you have a historical door that's 100 years old. You know, I mean, you really can't do that much. To it. If, if it's wood door too, it's probably inch and three eighths or inch and three yeah. quarter and not reinforced with anything on the inside in, in the core of the door. Hmm. You can do stuff to harden the, the hardware and protect your hardware from being bypassed, but it's not protecting the bulk of the door. There are manufacturers who provide wood doors that are actually 15 minute forced entry bullet or whatever. And again, to try and find a mill worker who can work with those products to kind of replicate what you might have. But as I said, it might be best at that point, if you can't touch it, leave it for the historical appearance of it and work inside to build yourselves where it's not historical and nobody's going to bother you if you wanted to Put up a bulletproof uh, entryway in there with you know all kinds of locking on it to protect your people and your walls are critical that's the other thing if you have all of this hardware but yet you've got a drywall that you could just punch your hand through and reach in and turn the lever and you can't get anybody protected a three-foot door doesn't unless you all line up behind it it doesn't pr provide much security so you've got to look at the overall picture of what you're trying to do. Next question. Is it better to protect the entire gap in the door from floor to ceiling than just protecting the latch area? I would say, yeah, because today you're not talking about, you know, just somebody popping open a latch bolt. They could take an ax to the door. They could shoot at the door. You know, there's so many different things that they could do. And, and criminals today, they know, okay, look, right in this particular area, this is where they're going to do all the reinforcement. I think it depends on which opening in your building you're talking about, yeah. too. I mean, if it's your exterior, your main point, yeah, reinforce the whole thing. If it's a classroom door further in or something like that, maybe focusing on the hardware is all you need for yeah. that. Because ideally, no one would get past that point without being stopped. Understood. Thank you. Again, uh, it really depends on an individual project. I totally understand your point. Thank you for clarifying. That's why Sarah recommends that you get an architect to come in, that they can look and see, okay, we can build you a man trap here. Your first line of defense won't be your exterior. Yes, you've got beautiful windows. You've got a beautiful door. That's fine. It looks great to an intruder that that's where they're going to get in. But then when they get in, they find out that, ah, oh, 
they're, they have this, you know, so that they can't. I'm glad nonetheless that occasionally you might be able to step in directly and at least give some advice to uh, facilities like the ones in the community because architects are expensive. Yeah. It's difficult to contemplate a budget for architects under the grant or take that out of your capital budget to be able to afford architectural assistance. And typically that lasts quite a bit. And sometimes just unless you're really redoing a lot of, uh, I guess, walls and openings around your building, it's difficult to justify. So I'm glad that I'm hearing like you're still able to at least get on the call and at least say, you know what, it seems like you're doing this. Here is what you We would recommend this. But, you know, maybe that's as far as we can go with sure. the help that we provide. And if sure. I remember, I see Ann on, and I think, Ann, we had a chance to talk with you. <laughs> that's great. Do you recommend having a, a key backup to electronic access control, electronic locking system? That's the nice part. One of the things that everybody talks about with electrified latching is fail safe and fail secure. That is talking about your outside lever. We never impede egress except on psychiatric dementia units, prisons, things like that. That's the only time where if that's under the control of somebody to let people out so that they don't escape, needless to say. So you best approach is to do fail secure on your outside where your security is. So it would be like having a storeroom lock where you always need a key. And the only time that it unlatches or unlocks is when a card reader is used and a voltage is sent to that and it's momentarily so that they could turn a lever to come in, you know, or where you have ADA, we might have electrified latch retraction. But the best idea is that it's always latched, always locked as long as possible. And in some cases, the, the fire department may need access to your door and they may have, they may request a, a knock box you know, on the exterior for your facility, and that would have a key. And so that key could key override to let them into the building. Excellent. That's a very good point for some of our audience to consider because you're all in different jurisdictions, even though most of you are in and around New York City. But for whatever municipality you're part of, the fire code will be slightly different or sometimes different by quite a bit. So make sure you coordinate whatever you're doing to your doors and openings with your fire department and uh, make sure that it's code compliant, as we've been saying all along. And we just heard Sarah and Carol mention again. So going back to classroom doors and some other door types, do you recommend protecting the glass on classroom doors with the center thin glass panel? So I, I'm referring back to the better type of door that you were referring to when you showed two viewing panels. So do you recommend still protecting the glass of that classroom door? Since, you know, so, so much happened with Sandy Hook and things like that, you know, there's actually where if you have a glass side light or like a glass vision panel, that there is like a wicket type of door that you can flip over and lock so that that defeats the glass. You know, if you have a side panel, you put on the inside, you put a little door that flips over it so that then they, even if they broke the glass, they can't get into the space, mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. that. But they do, they do make impact resistant mm -hmm. glass. And bullet resistant and, and blast resistant. And you know. obviously if you have the smaller the glass, the harder it is for somebody to, to get their hand in, you know, or... And know. the cheaper the glass is going to yeah. be, because <laughs> you yeah. don't have to buy as much. I know everybody wants daylight because it feels good, but sometimes it's better to have a solid door. And sometimes, like for this example, this is a stair door, and we're assuming that there's a panic push bar on the inside of it, and people abuse those doors all the time. They slam through them, and, and the glass here, we're assuming, is uh, to prevent someone from getting hit with the door. Hopefully yep. it will slow someone down yeah, coming yeah. through it. But. Yeah. And, and one thing keep in mind for any time, so wire glass was a very popular fire rating situation where it looks like the chicken wire inside of the glass, that's the olden days. That is against the code now because of the fact that people can get shredded, you know, and, and injured by it. Don't think that like, oh, I'll just get wire glass put in here and even if they break it, they still won't be able to get in. There's another code violation there, especially like in a classroom. Now, there, there are some companies that do make impact resistant wire glass, but it's, it's really, really pricey. So not, not to mention, <laughs> not to mention uh, uh, this is how thick it is, for example. And they, if you can, oh, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that you don't just put into an ordinary door frame, you know, glass uh, light 
frame stuff, stuff like that. Now to uh, bring us one level down here from like a lot of terminology. And I know that for many of you who are joining us today, please don't forget that if there is like a term that you're not understanding, please just come back to the RSMs. We'll, we'll guide you and we'll, you know, might follow up with Sarah and Carol if we didn't understand something. But please make sure that the interaction continues if something, if any of the terminology is difficult to understand for you, please let us know. What is the security difference between an electric strike and electric lock? I I know that at your level, Carol and Sarah, um, you probably won't hear that from architects, or maybe you do, but what's your typical answer? Oh, they want to know the cheapest way, and generally to put the middle one, the electric strike, is the thing. But here's the deal. So the little piece in the middle, that's the tongue. When you provide the electric current to that, that flips open, and all you need to do is pull your door open or push it open you're not retracting your latch bolt. Where with an electrified lock, the latch bolt is engaged, your outside trim, your lever or your knob, knobs are out most of the time now for ADA, but that is where the power comes to. That's why it comes through the door. We talked about that raceway, bringing the power from the frame side through. That momentarily releases so you can turn that lever to pull the latch bolt back. So for example, you you somebody, is getting ready to come in and the the, la the lever is released but you can immediately through your security system cancel that signal so they can't open the door because that latch bolt is still engaged in that frame yeah so your electric strike sits in your frame and that's where your power would come and most electric strikes i think it says it's 75 pounds holding force yeah so anything oh, more than that your tongue's going to break wow. and your door is just going to be push and pull. So. That's a very good addition here. Very important to remember. We talked about holding force in, in a few other uh, webinars. So those of you who are taking notes, please remember that locks have different tolerances. The flimsier the lock, the more easy it's going to be to just break through. And even with uh, something like an electrified st electric strike, still, he, as you can hear, the, the holding force is not very high. Let's see. I think there's a question. If let's say a facility like Jewish nonprofit synagogue or community center or another facility hires you as a consultant. I understand that you're going to be able to some degree review the, the project. And would you still be able to prepare specifications to help with the RFP? Or are you going to kind of look for an architect still to do so? If you are planning on replacing the doors and frames, then yeah, or not just the frames. If you're planning on replacing the door or buying new hardware, yes, we can write a hardware set for that. If you're trying to keep everything and make field modifications, we can give suggestions on you may want to look at this, but all of the installation and the recertifications, if required, will have to be done by someone else. Got it. Okay. Uh, it's very important to remember, again, that Carol and Sarah are in North Carolina. And so when they're not in New York, the certifications would have to be done and coordinated locally. Let's see. If using a mortise lock, what is the recommended approach for the locking hardware to incorpor incorporate with electronic access control if electric strikes are not ideal? That would be what we just talked about with that electrification going to that lever so mm -hmm. that, you know, it releases the lever for you to turn. And that would be a case of where we call it fail secure so that outside lever is mm -hmm. always locked. You, you mm -hmm. need a key to get in, or you need the electrification from the card reader to get in. So it's all low voltage. Mm -hmm. the 24 power volts or 12. Yeah, if you present your card, the power runs through and it goes down the frame to an electric hinge or an electric mm -hmm. power transfer that mm -hmm. transfers the power from the frame to the door. And mm -hmm. then the power runs through the door to the electric lock. So it would work, it works Similar to an electric strike, the functionality is basically the same, just how they, uh, in terms of like security. Yeah, instead of the latch bolt releasing with the electric strike, the outside lever unlock. allows you to unlock it and turn it. And it's momentarily, as soon as you let go of the lever and the door closes, your door is relocked. You don't have to worry about it. When we had SecureTuck on a, a few weeks ago, they have a model that does exactly that. Oh, yeah. Mark Berger, isn't he the best? I've known him for almost 50 years. 
Well, okay. Mark had one of his people on, but yes. Who, who was it? Uh, Dave. David Klein. Oh, David, David Klein. yeah, yeah. They're, they're great people. They really are. If I could jump to the next one, what is the best way to secure double leaf doors? Vertical latching. Okay. Or so it, it does depend on if you have to have exit devices on them, like they're coming out of your assembly space or something. So we have exit devices. Those latch in the head and they can latch in the floor. So, so they're called vertical latching as we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So they would latch into the, the frame head and then they would latch into the floor. If it is a door that doesn't have an exit device on it, then on your one leaf, we would have the electrified lock set that we were talking about. And on your inactive leaf, you have flush bolts that's vertical latching. So they latch into the head and into the floor. And then there's different kinds of flush bolts. If you really wanted it to be secure, you're gonna want it to be where, yeah, oh, there's that. So these, are, these are surface vertical rod exit devices. And as you can see, they latch at the top and down at the bottom. And if they're not installed properly, you're not gonna get latching. And one of the biggest problems that we see constantly is the bottom latch bolts, that there's a little square part that gets recessed into the floor or recessed into the threshold in that particular case. If it gets dirt in it, that latch bolt can't drop down into it. If they replace the carpet, they usually remove them and they don't latch. It would defeat the purpose of that bottom latch if it's not latched. Ilya, I, I put this up just as a reference point. And while I have it up, if you could scan this door this is the exterior and an interior side of the same door you spoke about the locking devices what do you see in particular on these doors that should be addressed potentially if you could maybe take like a, a one minute just to look at that if you could if you can if you can't you know let me know as well i know it's just uh, two picks okay so there you go there's your outside levers okay and this is most likely a mechanical exit device so they would have to i can't see if they're i'm sure there's a key in? cylinder or whatever on the exterior there hey look can you zoom in i don't know i don't see it go the other way zooms, zooms, yeah, zooms get, get closer get closer i'm i'm wearing glasses but get closer if you can i don't know blow it, it up big enough as much as is that, or is that as far as you can go like if I I'm get a little bit closer, I don't know if I can. These look like non-locking to me. No. Okay, those are the Securitech ones that are definitely providing you. Right there, you've got three-point latching. And if you notice the one on the right, you're showing where you've got uh, the push paddle for the exit device to go out. And you have it, there's the electrification for it and stuff. So there you've got top, bottom, and side. That only works on a single door, not a pair like we were just looking at. But they have some... So Wait, see that one? That one there is a mortise lock, and that's the multi-point. We use that a lot. It's a great product for security. As you can see, you've got that three-quarter latch bolt at the bottom, and that middle piece is what I told you about, the deadlocking feature down the on, the, on the bottom yeah. part where the, yeah, right the step part. So if you point to that little tab in the middle, when that door closes against the, the strike, that pops in and then you cannot defeat that latch bolt by you know trying to push it to make the two prongs go in and release. So that's a deadlocking latch bolt that I was talking about. Up above is an actually one inch throw dead bolt, which gives you extra protection completely. In this particular case, I'm believing that the cylinder probably only projects the dead bolt up above and retracts it and when the deadbolt is retracted with the key that outside lever is actually a passage set and remember that code requires single action you want to go into that single action is not on this side single action is on your inside as you can see here it tells you that thumb turn or lever retraction operates all of the deadlocks simultaneously that means one twist of that inside lever everything retracts so you have immediate egress out. So although you have all of those bolts there, uh, you know, going top, bottom, and into the side, one twist out or, you know, and one push of that paddle gets you out immediately. Everybody retracts simultaneously. And again, with night locks and other kinds of things when you're looking at securing classrooms? You can't have, for example, a separate deadbolt. And this goes on if you ever go into public, older buildings with public restrooms, usually about five feet high, there'll be a thumb turn on the inside and a cylinder on the outside for a deadbolt, okay? Those are illegal because you could lock somebody in there 
and you know they can't get out. So that's one of the things that you've got to be careful of. You can't just add a, a separate deadbolt above and say, you know, good, we're secured now. Right. That's technically two actions. You have to retract the deadbolt and then turn the lever or knob to get out. Mm-hmm. Again, for all of you who are listening, if you choose to watch this, and if you have any questions or if any questions. And, um, you know, as you're contemplating your individual projects, please do get back to us and go through your RSM and we'll try to get you more answers if necessary. That's really good. Um, Also, YouTube has amazing videos for you to watch. All you do is you type in your question regarding hardware like Asa Abloy, Allegion, all these manufacturers have videos that show you how things work, how they're installed. And some of them even offer online chat where you can write a message to them to ask about a specific product you might have seen in their catalogs and so forth. All of them have their catalogs are online also as PDFs. You can pull them up and look at all the different pieces of hardware. You're bringing up a very good point. We've been trying to hammer the point of talking to manufacturers and asking them questions because they have their own engineers. They know their products in and out and they can explain how all their products work and provide cleaner explanation, if you will, kind of a layman's explanation of how their devices operate. Would you recommend the addition of door pins above or below the hinges rather than unscrewing the regular hinge screw and then replacing it with a screw pin? There are security studs they're called, that you Mm. can add, okay, but that only is when, so when your door is open, the hole is on one side, the pin is on the other, and when it closes, then that pin engages into the frame, again, making it, your hinges could be on an outswing door, for example. If you did not get NRP, which means non-removable pin, where you can think about your home residence doors. You can take a nail and you can bang it from the bottom up and pop the pin out to take the door off it right out of the opening. And that's something else we didn't mention, you know, but again, something that you could ask us about. So on outswing doors, you want to make sure that you have a non-removable pin hinge. We have to add it to our clients' submittals all the time where they're running automatic programming. And so they miss the NRP part on an outswing door that has a lock on it, for example. NRP, again, is non-removable. Non-removable pin, which Uh, means if you had that hinge at your home and you needed to get that door off its hinges to take it out of the opening, good luck. Thing is, is that doors don't make you totally secure if they can be defeated. That's a critical thing. You can't do anything with the lock side because you got a lock, lock protector, but the guy can bang the hinge pins out and pull it off. He's just going to open the door from that side instead of this side. Well, even with our embassy projects, you know, we see 15 minute resistant doors. It's mm. not something that's supposed to keep people out for an indefinite amount of time. Right. It's supposed to allow the people inside the building enough time to get to their safe space and get away from the threat, away from the problem. Or if you provide security, provide on security, then that gives them the chance to take care of the intruder. Gotcha. Okay. A uh, slightly more expanded question. Let me sure. see if I can read it to you. And I ask you to see if you... you know, we'll take the quiz. We're ready. I will. No problem. Let's, <laughs> let's see if we can make this work. At our synagogue, We are replacing a second floor fire exit door that exits from a classroom onto a fire escape. There is a mesh window in the door, as well as a mesh window in the transom above the door. Are there any code requirements that require that we keep the mesh windows? That's the one that I mentioned earlier, that you can't have that. If it's wire glass where the wire is in between the glass, or you could have a security screen on the outside or on the inside, that's fine. It was like a, a fencing kind of a security screen that you know you have on the outside that would prevent them from getting to the glass. That's mm-hmm. fine. And I think a lot of places are grandfathered in if you have it there, but when you start replacing things, that's when you have to up, up to, to the, the new, new code. code. Would the new code permit this type of feature in the door? No, the wire glass mm-hmm. would not be permitted. The mesh, would most likely be permitted, you know, security mesh that might be permitted. But again, this is something that you got to run through a code consultant, which is why we recommend you have at least an architect to consult you who then always has a code consultant available to them. We we do this all the time. We'll send them a message and we'll say, you need to get hold of the code consultant if this is allowed. Sure. One one website that we can recommend that you really look at is called I Dig Hardware. By Lori Green. She yeah. works for One Allegiant. second. Yeah. Let's, I, let's type this I can, in. I can add it. What is yeah. it? I, www. I dig hardware. 
I'll by Lori Green. She is amazing. She's just amazing. Dot com? Oh, yes. perfect. Excellent. Thank yeah. you, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. And if you get started on her site and you go to her videos and you read her thing, you want to do that on a weekend when you have nothing to do because you're going to go, oh, I need to look at that. Oh, I like this. Oh, yeah. wait, I want to recommend this to somebody else. Now, she is a an expert in all things code related and she does a, a blog post every week. And it's all something, whether it's something she saw when she was out at the supermarket that was a code violation or someone wrote in a question to her. You also can write questions into her and she's pretty good about yeah, responding. Yeah, and it's free. This is what she does for Legion, you know, who ma the manufacturers, reps, who reps all of like Von Duprin and Schlage and uh, LCN and on and on and on, you know, all the different products. And, and Mark Berger, he always has his camera with him and he goes around, wherever he goes, he captures the most bizarre hardware applications. And Lori then does a lot where she takes his pictures and then she writes a whole blog about them. They, they've they been doing it for okay. years. It's, it's a blast. Uh, we have a few more left in the interest of everybody's time. So what's the holding force for a magnetic lock, just in comparison with the strike? They range from 600 pounds to 1,200 pounds. So they do have a strong holding force. But the problem with the magnetic locks that Carol mentioned during our presentation is that they have to fail safe. When your fire alarm sounds, if someone knows that they could just pull the fire alarm and all of the magnets are going to release and everything's going to be open, then that's one thing we don't like. They also can be defeated in that they have to have a PIR, which is a infrared sensor above the door. Sticking anything through the door and waving it will trigger your PIR and release your magnets. Although it has a high holding force, like 1,200 pounds, ooh, that's awesome. It's still not ideal. But keep in mind, here's another thing. We talk about, you know, easy defeat. You take that magnetic lock and you say, yes, I bought the 1,200 pound force. We're going to be safe. But you put it on a wood door that's not properly reinforced, like a hollow core door. As soon as they go to kick the door open, yeah, that 1,200 force is gone because they took the door the door broke, it, you know. <laughs> the maglock stays, but the door is gone. Yeah, it comes right through. We had that happen, a, a situation like that. They added it to a door. First off, it was against the code. They added it anyway. And then they got broken into anyway because they realized, oh, look, this is a crappy door. Just to clarify here, a very good question as a follow-up. Does a maglock have to be fail-safe if you have a panic bar that releases the lock? Yes, that is exactly how it works. Okay, so your panic bar, depending on how it's set up, you depress the panic bar, which is tied to the magnetic lock and releases it. But that's considered impeding egress, okay? So especially if you want a delayed egress, which means that you have a panic bar and there's signage on the door and it says, depress the panic bar, the alarm will sound, and 15 seconds later, that mag will release so that you can go through the opening. That has to be documented through the codes of your local jurisdiction to permit it, and it's not permitted in a lot of places. You mm -hmm. see them in like hospital, like pediatric homes, centers, uh, you thing. know, things like that. Uh, because they're controlled, the reason that they're permitted in those facilities is that there is people that have the control to release it immediately. We did an inspection on a hospital that had the infant care department and they had the mag locks on the stairs and everything so that parents couldn't snatch or a visitor couldn't snatch a baby and go out the stair door. But yet the nursing station had control of that door to either immediately lock it or unlock it and then the fire alarm also unlocked it. Yeah, so uh, that's an automatic door closer, I should say, with a half vertical rod application that Seth is sharing right now. You notice it also has a magnetic lock on it. Yep. Yeah, this is the hospital, hospital door. Even in the hospital, that application is not allowed all through their hospital. It's only allowed like at the dementia unit, the infant care unit, because yep. you've got a nurse's station right there with eyes on what's happening at that opening. Good point. In, all, in a lot of our facilities, please remember everyone that not always do you have the constant monitoring of your doors. Some of these applications may not be applicable to you. So please be careful when you're planning these. Can you have a glass panel where I can see who's inside, who's on the outside of the door, but they can't see inside? Uh, the easiest one that, that I can throw an answer in here is just you know, put mirror film on your glass and then that way it's a one-way film, basically. You're, you can see to the outside, but the people on the outside won't be able to see in. Carol and, and Sarah, what are your thoughts here? Any yeah, additional? That's fine because there's no code against that. You have the glass so that you can look out. 
But again, if it, the, the door is not, say, an insulated door, you could mm. be vulnerable because they could hear you moving to get to look out the glass. You don't want to ever put anything that's going to give you a false sense of security. Don't think that you're you're safe because you added the mortise lock or anything like that. You have to look at the overall picture of your opening and what your possible threats are. You know, we're seeing right now with the war in Ukraine, if you got a nut job or a New York City who has a RPG, that all of that isn't going to help. So don't think that you're safe. Take all the precautions, but keep your eyes open. Well, that's why we talked about layering. And that's why we talked about how very important it is to have proactive measures on the outside of your facility and the perimeter of your facility and thinking about those layers as any threat actor would be thinking of moving into your facility. So you would have early warning and early detection and early opportunities to not panic, but try to prevent further access to your facility and within your facility. And making that's your why- patrons... Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say, yeah, making your patrons that. aware of what the plan is. Exactly. If you, yeah. if you hear this sound, don't panic, but go this way. Like this yep. is this is the way we we would like for you to go because this is where yep. we're we're safe. Have drills just like we did back in the olden days when I went to school. We had air raid drills where we all went to the basement or we sat in the hallway with our heads covered. I'm, I was born in 1950. I'm old. And our fire drills. And you do the same thing for the security drill. When a, a light starts blinking, you have a uh, deaf in your, in your congregation, as well as if you don't want anybody to know, like hearing an alarm sound. So you have blinking lights or something, which is, a, okay, everybody's now going to leave their positions. They're going to get up and they're all going to go this way. And then it's also, the plan, if that's where the problem is, that they have another means to go. They move quickly and silently, the same thing with the plane, when they go over things. It's don't stop to get your pocketbook and put your shoes on and stuff. Go, now. A good question here is, and probably a very good question to close this with, is where can people find you? Oh, For good reasons. On. I'm not talking <laughs> about your house. <laughs> I worry about that. Really, I worry about that. You know, when, when someone's it's available. Who's asking? <laughs> when I was working on the United Nations project, when we got our security disks and things like that, and you had to have them locked in the vault and everything, I would always think to myself, gosh, I'm going to look out the window and there's going to be the troops coming to get me. <laughs> so we are CBR Architectural Hardware. We don't have a website. We'll put our email addresses in there and our phone number, and that's the best way. By the way, if you get our answering machine, if we don't recognize the phone number that we have you linked to, we don't pick you up because you could be just a telemarketer. If you start talking and we're in the office, we'll immediately pick you up and talk to you, and we ask you leave a message and also send us a confirming email. And we'll get back to you. And we get back to people fast because our architects are like, hi, we we just sent you an email. We didn't hear from you in the last 15 seconds. It didn't come through yet. We'll call you back. I I can close with this, that uh, my first education in uh, door hardware started at the UN. So Carol and I worked together on the UN renovation. This is where I started feeling very humble when I was walking into meetings, these big meetings with architectural firms, and everybody was uh, pulling their weight and trying to be the smartest person in the room. And then Carol gets on the phone and she puts everybody in their place to, to let people know that nobody knows pretty much anything about architectural hardware. And really, a person who spent years and years working in this business should have a minute to discuss it. <laughs> Carol saved, first of all, the UN a ton of money from, you know, from making just mistakes and also taught us all in the process. So I am very, very grateful. Thank you so much. And that's good to see you both. Uh, and by the way, for- I'm not all knowledgeable. One of the most important things, and, and I'll tell my clients this, the only stupid question you could have is the one that you don't ask. And I ask questions all the time. I'm on the phone to tech support. If I'm not sure about something, I'm going to the next level of expertise. And I'll research things into the ground until I can give you an answer. The good thing is that manufacturers, for the most part, are very, very generous with their time. Uh, they are. If, you, if you need them to be on the phone with you and walk you through how their products work or give you an idea about how to set something up, in most cases, particularly around New York area, I'm, I must say, people are likely to be available. They're likely to give you their time. Thanks, Ilya, for reminding me. Mm. So the big companies like Allegion, like Asa Abloy, they have free consulting services to write specifications. Sarah and I are blood-sucking leeches. We charge you, okay? Because that's our business. 
but what you can do is you can get a hold of these manufacturers' representatives and say, hey, you know, we want to buy your products and we'd like you to help us specify them. And they'll do it. Now, back in the day, they forced you to buy their product. So if they wrote the spec for you, because then they were going to get commission. Today, they don't do that. And they, you can make them make things equal. Like you can say, okay, I'm going to use sergeant locks and exit devices, but I want equals. And so they'll give you, uh, okay, we'll give you the, the Corbin Russell. Okay, wait, that's still Asa Aboy, so we'll, they'll put families. So you want to make sure that you get your equals to be the opposite family. So you put them in competition with one another. The Von Duper and Exit device may be cheaper in particular than the Sergeant or have better features. Don't just blindly take that they give you three manufacturers, but if you go to their websites and look, they're all under that same Asa Abloy or same Allegiant group. That's something that you want to do. And we'll help you do that too. You know, I mean, that's, that we can tell you, you know, go call so and so, and you know, get them to write them it, and we can it. tweak it. <laughs> and, and then the other thing is, if you get, oh, that was something quick that we forgot to tell you. Carol loves you, Harper. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's other things I love better, like my horse and stuff, you know, my kids, my grandkids. I like how the horse came first. The <laughs> horse came first, yeah. But, so, but anyway, if you get then from your contractor, you get your submittal for the opening, okay? We'll, we can tell you the format that you want to see. And then you can get us as an independent consultant for a fee that we will review that and make sure that they are giving you the proper products, that they're not giving you a a lesser grade because you don't know what it is because all of your hardware if you if you have time look at the catalogs online and you'll see that they give different ratings like this is grade one level this is grade two this is residential but you don't have to walk alone we'll walk with you on things to a limited amount fantastic passing it back to you david to close this off and i'm very grateful as i said if any other questions pop in please just write to your rsm or to our main email address can you can you drop that email address uh, very quickly for csi thank you i just wanted to thank carol and sarah and sarah and carol both teams for sharing their knowledge with us this morning. And we hope that some of you, as you go down the line, will reach out for professional assistance. When we started this, Ilya made very sure that we started with the best. And we started educating the RSMs on locks and doors and frames. And uh, our tutors were Carol and Sarah. So we want to thank you. And thank you for always being there with us and for us. And uh, have a good morning. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.